uh, lecture by Victor Davis Hanson, which propelled us to this conversation. So I'm holding up a book. This is Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath. So if you have a David, who's the young dude, uh, burgeoning to prove himself, and uh, what is the, the word called to uh, coming of age against the giant Goliath, you, um, you, for, you, if you only consider those two, you also have to consider that David had a mother, David had a fa father, might have had some siblings, had people in the community who know him, cousins, aunts and uncle, etc. So is David fighting for those people also? You bet he is. If, if Goliath is the brute of that region, you know, and how far could a man walk in a day? 18 miles, 10 miles, and if it's hot and rocky with no water, not very far. So that area with no water would be Goliath's stomping grounds. And David is protecting all those people in that area. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. What does it mean to be a general? What does it mean to be a general on home soil, general on foreign soil, a general that's going back to, to speak in Washington, D.C., to the people who haven't been where he's been, haven't seen the devastation or the potential of devastation that he or she has seen. So these are some of the things I want to bring Mr. C in and talk about that, the general away, the general home, and the therapeutic society that Victor Davis Hanson touched on in this discussion. Please share your thoughts on some of those topics. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, first of all, um, there is no question that um, since the turn of the 20th century, uh, the commanders of our military forces have generally speaking, and excuse that pun, but have generally speaking been combat veterans of some sort or another, whether it is in the uh, uh, kinds of wars which in which we engage now, uh, which are, let's see, what's the word they use? Um, uh, hmm, I'll probably think of it later. But it's not the de declared war. Okay, here's the phrase, unconventional war. World War I, Part A, World War I, Part B, were conventional wars, world wars. Um, we can look back in history and, and we can cast our eyes on conflicts of the past and we say you know what at the time that was a world war for example the conflicts between france and england back in the 14th 15th and 16th century uh the conflict between england and spain those were world wars because anytime you're engaged in in conflict wherein other parties are brought into it that's a world war. I would suggest to you that the American Revolution, if you think about it, was a world war. Why? The French, the Germans, the Prussians, all eventually, the Hessians, all eventually became involved. Now, if you're involving other parties in your conflict, it's a world war. Can I suggest the same thing about Korea? Yes, it was a world war in the sense that at that time we had the United Nations under which flag all of those forces, although the predominant, the greatest majority were US military forces under which those troops served. Same thing with Vietnam. We had troops from Australia, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, uh, the Philippines, England, England, and so on. So anytime you're bringing in other states to your conflict, that's a world war. Can you give me an example of a non-world war? Yes, the American Civil War. Because what did the Europeans do to make sure they didn't get involved? The English because they wanted to get the South out of the cotton business because they were growing their cotton business in the Middle East. And they had a textile industry that was being hurt by the, uh, you know, the, the, the United by the States. Cotton, yeah. By the cotton, the cotton plantations of the American mm -hmm. South. The French, yes, 
the French, you know, why? Because they were trying, not, not a lot of people know this, remember the French and Indian War, which the French lost to the British, by the way, but did the French hope to get a greater toehold in Canada? You better believe it. In yeah. fact, the toehold they have today is a function of exactly what happened during the Civil War. Because while all of this was going on below the Canadian American border, what were the French doing in Canada? Politics. Acquiring more territory and <laughs> developing spheres of influence. Yes, develop, key word, spheres of influence. So when we look at generals, um, I would be suspect of any general who did not have experience with war, whatever its form, whatever its form, whether it's low level, unconventional conflict. Uh, there's a great show on, uh, I like it because it's so real. The, the, the advisor on the show is a former SEAL. It's called SEAL Team. And yes. I don't know if you, Henry, I don't know if you've watched it, but if you haven't, you should. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the principal actor, David Boreanaz, and, and he does a really great job of demonstrating the conflict, the internal, moral, ethical, psychological conflict of making decisions either in the middle of combat or prior to or after combat. Um, there's a uh, movie out, uh, We Were Soldiers and Young. Um, and then uh, there's another one called Black Hawk Down. Now yeah. I happen to have the great privilege of, of having read the Black Hawk Down before it was ever pub published and asked for my commentary. And what struck me about both of these two books was how real they are in their presentation of that dichotomy which exists within an individual who has command. And I don't care what level that is. I don't care what level that is, whether it's the captain in charge of a platoon or the lieutenant colonel in charge of a reg regiment or the colonel in tar charge of a battalion or the, the brigadier general in charge of an air wing they have to make decisions which in change lives, which cost lives, which save lives. And to have that kind of power, that's power at its most basic power. Remember what I said earlier in the clip earlier? I just, I realized as we were talking, the first ever war was that between Cain and Abel. Cain made a decision. Would Abel have tried to persuade him not to do what he did? You better believe it. Why? Because he had a family. And why would he try to persuade Cain not to kill him, to protect his family? Yeah. Okay. So, but Cain is looking about his own family, his own home, his own territory, his own security, his own safety, and say, you know what, I need to do this. It's wrong, but I need to do this. And taking a life is wrong. It is the sixth commandment, right? <laughs> thou shalt not kill. No, it's, it's, it mis mistran it's mistranslated. It's supposed to be thou shalt not commit murder. Depends on the, the translation you're reading. But murder is still killing, isn't it? Yeah. And how do I know this? Because I've killed. Mm -hmm. Even if it was at a distance, I killed. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I, I bear that. Mm -hmm. That is the burden that those who serve in combat bear. Because they mm -hmm. know what they've done. And it violates their entire moral compass compass mm -hmm. okay so when i look at generals like you you've discussed and the issue you raised here it's like yeah could i do it i don't know 
I know what I did. I, I remember sitting a hundred feet underground and realizing that we had the capacity to destroy ourselves. Uh, and it was like, oh my God, I was only 21 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. I just turned 21. And to realize that your life could end in an instant because of a decision made by someone far away from you. You know, it's, and, and a lot of people don't realize this. When I wrote this in the email to you, the commander in chief of the mil U.S. military forces is the only person who can order the launch of nuclear weapons. But think about this. What about the, the officer, male or female, sitting in that Minuteman silo in North Dakota, holding the key, and the order comes down to insert the key, and then the order comes down to turn the key, to launch it. No, no. And what the consequences of that action are going to be. Death and destruction on a scale never seen in human history. You know, so um, it's, it's, um, it is not, I, I, let's go back to, to Patton was the ideal soldier. Salute smartly, carry out the mission. That show SEAL Team, the character played by David Boreanaz is the ideal soldier. Give me, tell me what you want me to do. Tell me why it's important. And they always do in that particular show. They always say why we're doing, and the war is against terrorism in all its forms. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand that the relationship between that word and the word deterrence, they both have the same root in Latin uh, to cause fear. And so when you get those orders, when Patton was given orders by Eisenhower, uh, he carried them out. And the Germans were justifiably afraid because this man had no fear. I will give you two examples from Native American history of the kinds of generals. <clears throat> Sitting Bull, okay? led the campaign across the plains, led to what happened to Custer, all right, at Little Bighorn, and then Chief Joseph of the Nez Pierce. Now, what many people don't know is that within the Native American cultures, not all of them, but most of them, there were not individual chiefs or ran the tribe. There was a chief for everything, that there, in many of the Native American tribes, many of them were matriarchal. And so women were part of the decision-making process. So when there was a war, and believe me, the Native Americans did wage war on each other, uh, there would step forward a chief to do that. <laughs> Sitting Bull was that. He was a war chief. Chief Joseph of the Nez Pierce was a peace chief, although he had been in combat. Because why? Because all of the young men of the Native American tribes, particularly of the Plains Indians and the Plains of the Southeast, that was part of their growing up process. They learned how to handle weapons, how to, when horses were introduced into their culture, they learned how to ride horses. They learned how to use horses in combat. Uh, so was it, did he understand what the consequences of war were? Yes, he did because he'd been there, done that as a young mm -hmm. man. So when he rose to the position within his, the Nespier's tribe, and became a chieftain, a chief, he was not a war chief. And he was the one who led his tribe onto the reservation because he politically recognized that he could not defeat the white man. He couldn't. 
technologically the white man had him beat out the gate. Sitting Bull, yeah, he had that great victory at Little Bighorn, and there were little, and there were literally other victories as well. But the tide was rising, and there was no question about what was going to happen. So we come to the modern period, and what what do I what do I see our modern military doing? Well, let's go back to a war, Iran Iraq. It began while I was still on active duty. Um, at the same time, uh, that was in 1981. Uh, prior to that, the Russians had invaded Afghanistan. Um, I remember my commander asking me what they were thinking, and I was I said to him, I don't know, because obviously they haven't read their history books. And of course, we all know what happened, that that eventually the war, the Russian war in Afghanistan would bring down the Soviet Union. It did. It brought it down. Too, too long and too costly. And, and the, the people who couldn't vocalize their dissent back in the Soviet Union were uh, were doing what they could, talking to each other, missing their, their nieces and nephews and their brothers and sisters, their sons and uh, not daughters probably that much, but their sons. <laughs> And they and they knew that 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 could not continue on um, from the Politburo issuing issuing those ridiculous orders of continuing each and every year when they're wait, standing in a bread line for a few hours and maybe not getting anything after those few hours. And why 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 was Mao Zedong so successful with the Communist Revolution? He was a general in the Communist Army, Chinese Communist Army because he had learned the lesson from Genghis Khan, because he had learned the lessons from Alexander, because he understood that how do you, how do you win the people with wheat, with rice, with, rice. with food, you feed them, you feed them, it's real simple. Uh, Genghis Khan, his way of winning because he would lay siege to these cities, moving across the Russian steppes and into, uh, although he had problems in Afghanistan, well, it wasn't called Afghanistan at that time, uh, the frontier provinces. Uh, he turned his attention to Europe. As you, you read that book I told you about, you'll find out he turned his attention to Europe. Uh, Alexander the Great ran into a problem in the Northwest frontier, which is now part of the Afghanistan, Pakistan nexus. And he ended up going on to Indian, because, India because into the Hindus uh, because he couldn't win the war there. And that's what Sun Tzu said. You can't win the land war in Asia. It's too big. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the forces you face are too diverse. Mm -hmm. So we now have been stuck in Afghanistan for 20 years. That is a function of the political choices, not the choices of the military. Now, the good thing about our nation is that our military is under the civilian leadership. The bad thing about our military is it's under our civilian leadership. Because what do warriors want to do? Win and go home win and go home. The world in which I operated for 20 years, part of it, we call our, I belong to groups, we, we're called the silent warriors. We're the behind, we're the behind guys and gals. Uh, and the stress is no less, like I mentioned, the, t the two people in the Minuteman silo, believe me, the stress of sitting there with a key on a chain around your neck, looking at a console on which there is a slot into which that key can be submitted, inserted upon orders of the commander in chief of the military forces of this country is the kind of pressure that can just make you crazy, cause post-traumatic stress disorder. Because imagine what it's like if you ever have to do that and you think about the consequences of it. Now imagine somebody like Patton, he loved his troops. 
He did. That's why he was in front of them going into combat. MacArthur, think about how he was raised. Same way as Patton. Same. It's not as self-sufficient as Patton. His, his MacArthur's mother was living in an annex of West Point watching out for him during his tenure there. So he was a, a mama's boy. It's very interesting that the West Point allowed that to happen. But hey, uh, MacArthur, MacArthur talks in a, in a book I read on MacArthur, he, he, he talked about the time where he was uh, going through hazing. And he's a thin guy, as I am. And I do a lot of leg exercises and squats and running up bleachers and whatever. I don't build big hips and big legs. I just get a little more endurance and a little bit more strong and more stability. But he's the same build as I am, MacArthur, tall, thin guy. And he they put him back in the early 1900s with a saber, one guy holding a saber and another guy holding the other end under his crotch. And they make him put his legs out wide and get into a, a slight squat position. And, and then they had, they're chanting and they're waiting till he breaks down. And these guys that were doing that weren't going to remove the saber. They were going to let him Ginsu his groin and, yes. and, and suffer. And he talks about this and, you know, <clears throat> the whole idea of, of hazing and, and rushing a fraternity or being in the military hazing. It, I know where the roots come from. You know, they they go back to the Spartans and the native people and the tribal people before then. It's like they beat the heck out of you and they give you impossible things to see if you can perform physically, your character can hold it, your mind, body and spirit can endure that horrible stuff. I understand why it's there and maybe comment on the hazing and comment on the degree of the hazing in the in the early 1900s versus now it's virtually been eliminated from fraternities. Uh, you know, the going on, uh, putting people in the back of a U-Haul and locking them in and taking them somewhere they, they know not where, making them stay up for a few days and drinking till excess. All these things have been changed now because of deaths and dismemberments and physical breakdown uh, and mental breakdown. So maybe talk a little bit about this hazing in the therapeutic society in which we live. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that um, uh, you, you bring this up because I'm certainly uh, familiar with what happened to MacArthur because that was the culture of the time. And if you look at history and that you mentioned the Spartans is particularly important because um, of what was expected of Spartan men and women, All right? Um, as you know, Spartan boys were literally given to an older Spartan warrior and by our definition today, sexually abused. That was a rite of passage. Uh, nobody bothered to ask them how they felt about that. Uh, nobody bothered to talk with them after their initiation, if you will. Uh, that first rape, uh, and that we can, from our, we can from our far remove, look at that and say that's rape. Mm -hmm. uh, we can say that's child abuse, but mm -hmm. it was part of the culture, and the entire culture accepted it. So when we look at what MacArthur experienced, and by the way, that circumstance of his mother living close to the camp West Point, that was abolished a long time ago. Um, but the fact here's, I don't think many people, in fact, I'm pretty sure many people do not understand what the purpose of military training is. And, uh, certainly in terms of the Spartans, um, living as they did, and I've got a great video that talks about the Spartan experience, which I used in my class. Um, that considering where they were, where they lived in the worst part of the Greek, Greek uh, landmass. It was rocky. It was hilly. Uh, you couldn't grow a heck of a lot. Um, 
there wasn't much much in the way of industry not and and certainly in terms of the the things that occurred in Athens with Socrates Plato uh, Aristotle and so on uh, there wasn't that kind of society so what did the Spartans what did they focus their energy on survival now I know you've read Maslow a long time ago. What are that? What's the hierarchy of human needs? Food and drink, shelter and security, right? Those are the first three, the most important. And once you turn, once you have those first three needs met, what's the next thing? procreation, continuation of the self. Then we can get into the higher of the hierarchy of needs, you know, we're finally ending with self-actualization, being all you can be, blah, 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 which by the way, the United States Army used as a motto years ago. Remember that? Be all you can be. And now they use the army of one, or they use that for a while, army of one. Uh, be all you can be. The first time I heard that commercial, I, I did, I laughed. <laughs> right out of Maslow. It's, it's right out of the concept of self-actualization. And, and certainly in terms of my own experience in military basic training, and, and I went through 16 weeks, five, six weeks in San Antonio, Texas, and then 10 weeks in, in Mississippi. And I'll tell you what, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my 18-year-old life. But one of the things that it did do for me was bring me to the idea that I'm part of something. Now, admittedly, I'm fairly intelligent, kind of, sort of. And so I can step outside of that and say, well, yeah, I'm part of something that has a purpose. But is that all there is? Well, of course, it's not all there is. And that's why I wanted to pursue, went on and pursued the education I have. But you, you, the idea is to break, the idea of military basic is to break down those things which, uh, how do I put this? Those things which you have learned from the society in which you were raised which aren't taught anymore all right what do i mean by that when we look back at history and we look at those who led the troops who fought the wars that defended the state or the city or the whatever they came from a society wherein there were certain expectations about how you were supposed to behave when faced with a certain situation. So how, do, and even in the, I went in in 1961. In 1961, I know you were not born yet. <laughs> in 1961, we had come through a great war. We had just elected a president who promised us Camelot. And what did Camelot symbolize for most Americans at the time? King Arthur and the Round Table, um, uh, knights in shining armor, uh, no beautiful damsels and all those sorts of things, you know, and, and peace and tranquility. Well, <laughs> the, the peace, the plain and simple math, truth is there was not peace and tranquility at that time. But here's this handsome president and his beautiful wife and his two little children. And oh my God, we live in a perfect world. No, we don't. He's, a, he's an ex World War II man who almost lost his life. As a matter of fact, and suffered for it from the, for the rest of his life. And I, I can assure you, he had PTSD. You do not come out of combat and he was a combat veteran, you do not come out of combat without PTSD. It will, it will haunt you. 
And so when I look at someone like Patton or MacArthur and Eisenhower, all of these men had ex combat experience, all of them, of some fashion or another. Now, Eisenhower did, didn't have combat experience. Yes, he did. And where, I'll tell you where? how he had combat experience. You know, he led a convoy across this country after World War I. You knew that? Did you know? I, I, I knew um, I knew the 10 cities in in uh, in Washington, D.C. were was MacArthur that was was sent to disperse those 10 cities of veterans waiting for their checks in Washington, D.C. But I'm not I don't know about the Eisenhower combat. OK. Eisenhower was ordered to take a convoy of military vehicles across the country. I believe it was, was from, um, uh, I'll have to check this, but I think it was from uh, Fort Leavenworth. And it was, this is 1907, 1918. What's still going on at this time? Only well, on World War I is still going on. Still, World War I is still going on. And what else is going on? Uh, activity in China. Activity in no. China and activity on our southern border because we won't have the Gazdan purchase yet. So what's going on? Possible war with Mexico? Yep. Plus, are there still rampant groups of Native Americans who are raising hell on occasion yeah. when yeah. they can? Okay. Yeah. So what is it? So he's, Eisenhower's got this entire convoy of military vehicles mostly trucks, and they're loaded with equipment that are going to need it on the West Coast to defend that particular border, if you will. Uh, he, of course, during this, he's a major at the time, and he realizes that this vast nation is helpless. How is it helpless? Because we have no way to defend either the West Coast or our southern border. Yep. So what does, when he finally gets into a position where his ideas can be heard, he never forgot this. And so when he's elected president in 1952, what's the program he started? The interstate highway system which is which has as its main purpose the quick movement and deployment of military forces that is a strategic thinker and that's the difference between an eisenhower and macarthur and patton macarthur and patton were tactical people eisenhower was a strategic man one of the things that Hanson you talked about in his was General LeMay. I served, I had the honor to serve under LeMay when he was chief of staff of the Air Force. Did you know why he kept a cigar in his mouth for the... Yeah, uh, yeah I knew about that. Everybody did. Everybody did. What is, what is that face situation where you're paralyzed on Palsy. one side of your... Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy. Yeah. LeMay rose to the position he did after he built the Strategic Air Command and turned it over to Tommy Power, Thomas Power, who I served under when I was in SAC. Uh, and again, a general I would have followed into hell. LeMay, I would have followed into hell too, because the Strategic Air Command was the first, not the first line of defense, but the final line of defense to keep this country safe. And of course, out of that, we built the triad, you know, Poseidon missiles, uh, why, don't, why don't we why don't we do the Cold War next time around and we'll yes. finish up here? Yeah, we'll do the Cold War next time. I don't want to get into the Cold War. I want to stay focused on the difference between Eisenhower as a strategic thinker and Patton and MacArthur as tactical thinkers. Now, in the email I sent you, I mentioned MacArthur's losing his job as commander of forces in Korea during the Korean War. And it was a war. 
uh, they now call it a war, not a conflict, which is good for our Korean veterans. Mm. Um, at the time, he, what he wanted to do, and, and I didn't learn this, of course, until after I was in the service and I had my clearances, I didn't learn these things until I was in the service. He wanted the Air Force to drop what he called nuclear weapons north of the Yalu River. We didn't have them. At the time we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we only had three. Now, of course, over the next few years, we built more. At the time the Korean War broke out, I think we might have had a half a dozen, but we didn't have any what they call tactical. Call from one I just blocked it. Um, it's nobody I know. Uh, we didn't. We didn't have nuclear weapons or tactical nuclear weapons. We had strategic nuclear weapons. We had weapons that could take out large areas. We didn't have ones that could go down and, and target a troop movement in, in, an, in a specific exactly. area. Yeah, and certainly, as I outlined to you in the, in the email I sent, when you contemplate the use of these weapons, tactical weapons, you have to take into consideration where they're going to be used. A strategic weapon has as its purpose, but let me give you a modern example of the use of a strategic weapon, 9-11. I got into a disagreement with somebody who wanted me to write a column for him for his newspaper down in Southern California. And he knew about my background and I, I gave him as much information as I could at that time. Um, the strike on New York City on 9-11-2001 was a strategic attack. What is the purpose of a strategic attack? I'm being a teacher now, so I need you to answer the question. To strike fear into your uh, opponent. What else? It's more multi-level than that. It, well, let's uh, go back to what's a tactical. It, what's a tactical attack? You you do it. I don't want to. I don't want to. I'll do a lecture, but not a guess. <laughs> okay. All right. A tactical attack is to stop something that's going on immediately. Okay. Um, Certainly, I can look at my own experience. I can look at things that happened in Vietnam and I can say, well, this and this. But I think 9-11 is the perfect example of, of the difference between a tactical attack and a strategic attack. Um, did what Osama bin Laden do that took years of planning, by the way? You know, it didn't, he didn't one day wake up and say, we're going to, we're going to, capture two planes, we're going to drive them into the Twin Towers in New York City, we're going to get another one, drop it on the Pentagon, and then we're going to get another one, we're going to drop it on the Capitol. Uh, he didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to do that, and I want this done by next week. Didn't happen. This, hmm. this took years, it took planning. He had to get through people into the flight schools here in the United States. Why? Because the aircraft they were going to be using were US made. All right? So. The years of planning, that's what st strategy is. Uh, what was the consequence of that attack? Woke up a sleeping giant. No, it didn't. It made societal change. Now, I've joked about this in the past. It's not really a joke. You've, you, American citizens who might be watching this, you've had no privacy since the early 60s. Trust me on that one, all right? How much privacy do you have today? The, the number one way to get privacy is the fact that we have so many people so, sending so much stuff that the, uh, the secret forces in our country and elsewhere can't just can't go through all that the only thing they can do is do keyword um algorithms to pull things out and attempt to put more concentration on certain people with those keywords that's my guess on the big problem for them you, now you, and I'm, you keep believing that 
<laughs> you keep believing that. <laughs> Remember, Henry, the world I came out of when I came out of the Air Force, trust me, they want to know who you are and where you are. They will find you. Mm. No, I, I agree with that. But I'm saying in terms of processing my emails and videos as as compared to all the other people who have emails and videos, that's a lot of work for a small group of people. They're going to keywords are just part of it, just part of it. But the strategic attack that happened on 9-11-2001 changed our society in not just fundamental ways, but in strategic ways. Let's go. Let's let's stop here because we're over time and we'll, we'll take this up in the next go around. I'm Henry Croyder. This is Mr. C. And we wish you all the best in your health, happiness and wellness. Keep an open mind. Please like thumbs up down below and leave your respectful comments. And we'll do our best to answer any that we're able to. Aloha. I'd like to have a I'd like to add a comment. And if you can't be respectful, trust me, we'll delete you. <laughs> Aloha, brothers and sisters. Aloha. Real, real, what? Let me get it in the screen. There we go. Henry, this.